Okay, let's start. Uh, are there any questions, any remarks, anything you want to know? Okay. Okay, so we're doing graph theory. Today's plan is to uh, repeat some of the earlier things that I did last Friday about connected components. And then prove a theorem which says that if you have more than a certain number of edges, your graph has to be connected. Okay? So it's actually something you will expect. The number is very big. So it's not very efficient in terms of theorem. I mean, it, but it's still a nice result. And it's nice to see you can prove things like this, that you can show that certain graphs has to be connected because they have more than a certain number of edges. Uh, I'll also start talking about degrees. Because, as uh, you may remember, there were three problems that we want to attack using graph theory. Uh, one of them was this Koenigsberg bridge problem. And then the solution came using the degrees of vertices. So uh, we will look at degrees and prove things like some of the degrees is twice the number of edges. Or we will prove some basic observations about degrees of a graph. I'll give you a homework set today. At some point, I will write it on the board. And this will finish first two sections in graph theory from the book Grimardi. And maybe I will start trees on Friday. OK? So uh, just to remind you, uh, a graph. This uh, consists of of a set of vertices we always talk about some finite graphs so let me say it's like some numbers and a set of edges So look at number of vertices, number of edges, some of the relations with them. Uh, together with, uh, together with uh, two functions, basically tells us how the edges are connected to vertices. Uh, one is the source function, and the other is the target function, called. source and target functions. So their assignment which tells you how the edges attach to the vertices. And because we have two functions, we can actually think this is directed graph. So uh, for undirected graphs, Uh, we ignore this direction. We ignore ignore the direction coming from uh, coming from these functions. So technically, this is the description for a directed graph uh, because it has a nature direction coming from source and target. But we often will consider undirected graphs and. So we'll not be worried about which one is the initial point. So we'll not even draw arrows on the edges. Okay. So uh, we often we often draw a picture uh, like this. Okay. So the vertices are big dots, and the edges are lines. So we, we make the dots bigger to emphasize that. 
and then these uh, edges are lines. This is technically, again, a multigraph, a directed multigraph. So you can, you can have multi-lines between and then there's directions. This is the most general definition. So we'll be having possibilities of many lines between two things. Okay. And because of the way it's written, it has directions. So for example, a source of E4 is the vertex 2, target of E4 is the V4, uh, V3. Okay, so for E5, it's similar things. For E2, for example, the source is V2, target is V1. So this is the directed version of the multigraph theory. Again, uh, we will skim it to into non-directed and non-multi cases most of the time. We'll just look at those cases, but this is the most general version. Okay, so we say this is the definition. We say uh, two vertices, V and W in V, communicate with each other. So this is definition of communicate. If there is a sequence of edges, this sequence of edges is usually called path. Uh, we had this description of paths and walks, and, I, I, and this is same as saying there's a path. So a sequence of edges, say k of them, such that these edges are attached to each other. So the for each eye from this set, the target of the EI is same as the source of EI plus one. And you of course want the original source to be V and the target of the last one be double. So it's from V to W. This is often also called a path from V to W. Such a sequence is called a path. We denote uh, this relation by V communicate with W. Now this is a relation between two two vertices, okay? So relations uh, we haven't covered in this course, but I can say a couple of words about it. Um, so, so let's do a crash course on relations. to understand what I'm talking about. So a relation is like the equality or modulo n relations. It's defined on a set. So a relation R on a set S is a set of, or a set of, or a subset of, S cross S, okay? So R is a subset of S cross S, satisfying certain conditions. So subset of this. We say R is any constellation if it satisfies these three conditions. So some of the high schools used to teach this, but I don't know if you learned it before. But equivalence relation is a generalization of equalities. But you just make it a more abstract notion. So things like, uh, so 
instead of writing pairs, it's better to write this wiggle sign. So let me write it here. So um, to say x comma y is in R, uh, we denote this by saying that x wiggly, sometimes you put R here, sometimes you don't. So you say x and y are related. Okay? So this is the notation for being related. This is actually the notation for communicate relation, but this is a more generally a sign for a relation. So what we want is that everything to be related to itself for all x and s. So x should be related to itself. That means x cross x comma x should be in R as a subset of s. Second thing is that if x related to y and for some x and y, this should imply that y is related to x. So the relation should be symmetric. We also have transitivity. If you have x related to y, y is related to z. If you have both of these, then you should be able to say x is related to z. Okay. So one first question you will ask to yourself, is this relation we just defined for the graph, vertices of the graph, is this a relation that I can call it an equivalence relation? Okay, so that's one thing that we should state. Uh, proposition: the relation on the vertices defined by on the vertices v defined by v communicates with w. with w, which is denoted by this. V is communicates with w, is an equivalence relation. So this is uh, something we observe. Why is it equivalence relation? Because remember how we define the communicate. Communicate means to have a path, right? So you need to have a path from V to W to say that they communicate. So you can easily see that everything communicates with itself because you have a trivial path. You could just have a path which um, you should say you don't have to go anywhere. It's just where it is. Now, if you have a path from X to Y, you can take the path in the other direction. Of course, we are talking about uh, in an undirected graph. Let's say this one. On an undirected graph. So we should ignore the direction to be able to say this. So if you if you have a path from here to here, you have a path from here to here, ignoring the directions. So anytime V communicates with W, W communicates with V by taking the path in the other direction. Now, the difficult one is the transitivity. If you have x communicates with y, y communicates with z, it's obvious that x will communicate with z using y as an intermediate stop. So if you have a path from <laughs> x to y, some path with lots of vertices, okay, and then you have another path uh, with lots of vertices from y to z, which then you have a path from x to z which goes through y. Right? So you can see that the relation that x communicates with y and y communicates with z is a transitive relation. You can compose it. So these three checks through, and you can say that you have equivalence relation. Okay? Now, why this is important? Because when you have an equivalence relation, you can decompose your set into equivalence classes. Okay? So when you have an equivalence relation, when there is an equivalence relation, V 
we have equivalence classes. The composition to equivalence, the composition into equivalence classes. Namely, uh, for any element in your set, the subset of S defined by So you take this subset of x, which is formed by all the things that equivalent to your x. Okay. So this is a subset of S, and it is this exact subset of things that related to your x. Okay. So this is called uh, equivalence class. Called the equivalence class. Class of x under this equivalence relation. So what we have is this from the general theory of equivalence relations. We have uh, this decomposition. The set S can be written as disjoint union of, of equivalence classes over. So you, you don't have to take. Uh, more than one representative, so over the representatives of equivalence classes. Of equivalence classes. So this is a very basic idea. Say we want to look at all the people in this building, all the students, say. And we say two students are related if they are in the same classroom. Now, this is a relation, makes you related. You are in the same uh, class, is a relation. Now, under this relation, you have equivalence classes. Equivalence class of certain person is all the people who are in the same classroom, which means equivalence class of that person is it's the classroom that this person sits in. So this is the exactly all the members who are in the same classroom. Now. A person cannot be in the two classrooms at the same time. Because if you are in this classroom and if you're in the other classroom, these classrooms has to be the same. So that means these classrooms, they don't have intersections unless they are identical. Which means that it decomposes your entire building into classrooms. Each of these is a classroom. So you can write your building, your S, as a disjoint union of classroom members. Okay, this is all it says. There's nothing really goofy. But I'm going to use this to decompose the vertex set into equivalence classes coming from this related to being communicate. Okay? I will call them, I will call them connected components. Okay? So if you have a graph, if you have a graph, graph, the equivalence relation, so say G with vertex at V and E, the equivalence relation uh, V communicates with W uh, decomposes the vertex set, the vertex set V into equivalence classes each subgraph so let's say V is written as this union of these VIs each of these VIs equivalence classes of the vertex set the subgraphs uh, of these vertex sets generated on, generated by this vertex sets say call this GI generated by these vertex I all eyes 
are called the connected components. Components of G. So you write G as connected, this changing of these subgraphs. We had pictures before, we discussed this. You could have a graph looks like this. So this graph, totally G, has vertex at V1, V2, V3. I mean, you could have multiple lines if necessary. V4, V5, V6, V7, V8, V9, V10. So the vertex set has 10 members. And these things communicate with each other. These things communicate with each other. These things communicate with each other. So you have connected components. So this is your G1. This is your G2. This is your G3. So you have exactly three connected components. And your G is this gene of this. Okay? So this is the theory behind the components. And this is the definition of connectedness. A graph G is called connected if it has only one connected component. In other words, We can also say a graph is connected. If given any two vertex, we can find a path combining these two. Given any two vertices, V and W, there's a path from V to W. Again, this is undirected. We can change this uh, with different but directions are not important for this definition. When I say graph, I always mean undirected, okay? If I don't emphasize it, you should always take it as undirected. So if we don't draw these things, that means it's undirected. Okay? So this is the theorem that I want to prove. This is the result. A graph on n vertices that has more than n minus 1 choose 2 edges is connected. So we look at this and try to show why this is true. Now the obvious thing is you could try to draw a disconnected graph, a graph with two components, and you could see that it fails if you have to put less than this many edges. You can do it with different ends or you can sort of find a general argument. So let's discuss this uh, a little bit before the proof. Like for n equals 3, 3 points. n minus 1 choose 2 is 2 choose 2, which is 1. So that means more than means strictly more than. Okay? So this means strictly. That means if you have strictly more than one edge, you make these three points a connected graph. Again, this is a graph, not a multigraph, so you're not allowed to do this. Okay? So you have to you have to use this. Okay? 
but then it's connected. Right? So for n equals 4, you have four points, and n minus 1, choose 2, 3 choose 2, 3 points. So it's strictly more than this, means anytime you put four edges, this thing becomes connected. Can you see putting three edges is not enough? Can I put three edges and still have it disconnected? Uh, no? I can put three edges and it's disconnected. So three, three is not, we need to go above three. That strictly means that. So four, four makes it connected. So three is okay, but four, as soon as you put the fourth one, maybe you should say, we could say that number of edges is bigger or equal to plus one implies that G is connected. So this is the statement. If it's bigger or equal to one more than the, so anytime you have more than four edges, then a graph is connected. More than two, a graph is connected. The reason it's sort of, I mean, so what is n minus one choose two here? Four choose two. So with, with five points, Six is okay. You can put six edges and still have this connected. And because you can put all of them on between these, still disconnected. But if you put a seventh one, it becomes connected. Again, this is not about multigraphs, because in multigraphs, you can even put lots of edges in between two. So that's You can say, the best I can do is put all the edges between n minus 1 of them. But if I do it, I get n minus 1 choose 2 total. So if you go one more, I have to connect it. But uh, that's a problematic argument because it only covers that possibility. So if you have 10 million vertices, you could put uh, this like then you are looking at 10 million choose two edges or 9,000, like very big number of edges. There's so many different ways to put them that you cannot cover all possibilities by just saying that if I do it this way, I can't do it. So we have to find the conceptual argument which tells us that you can never get a disconnected graph with this many edges. So let me show you how it's done. Any ideas how this such a thing can be proved? Any ideas? So suppose uh, G is disconnected. So suppose it's not connected. Now then you have components, right? Then we have more than one component. So you have these components, whatever they are. It could be many of them. But in either case, there are more than one. So that means you can sort of think 
graph formed by this part and this part. So you can think all of these, doesn't matter if connected or not, and look at the other part, and call this G1 and call this G2, or G and G prime. Indexing is a problem. Call this part GA, call this part GB. Then we have two subgraphs, two disco two uh, subgraphs, GA and GB, such that there are no edges between them. So no edges between them means anytime V is here, W here, there is no edge. Because then they will be connected. So all the edges are in between these things. So let this first part has as many elements, and the rest will be number of vertices was n, n minus as many elements. So we assume that there are s vertices here. And then n minus s vertices will be here because total we have n vertices. But note that because we have at least two components, uh, the maximum number of vertices you can have here is n minus one. Okay, since we have more than one component. Since these are non-empty. Uh, we must have this s should be maximum n minus 1. Can't be n. We don't know what how many s here, but we know that maximum we can get is n minus 1. That's fine. Now, for each of these, what are the possibilities? I mean, you can go to vertices here. You can go to vertices here. There's no vertices between. So all the possibilities of vertices, uh, we have n square possibilities, or n choose two possibilities. Uh, we could have And choose two vertices totally, or edges. But because we cannot have edges in, from edges between two components between G A and G B. We can we have so number of edges maximum it can be is all possibles minus the ones that are not allowed. How many of them are not allowed between vertices here and vertices here? There are s vertices here and minus s vertices here, so there are s times and minus n choices. Those are not a lot. And you could be less than that. I mean, this, this covers all possibilities together with all the edges. So it's less than this number. It could be much less, too. But.
Because this is minus, I want to estimate this number from below. S times n minus s. So let's call this PS. This is all possibilities. Like this is a minus s squared plus sn. This is a number where s can be uh, 1, 2, or n minus 1. So this is a parabola, some sort of minus s squared. And it passes through 0 and n, and it goes down, looks down. It's a parabola like this. And possible values are 1, 2, and so on, n minus 1. What will be the smallest value of such a thing? It's also symmetric, so basically it doesn't matter if you look at big numbers and small numbers. It turns out that just the parabola theory tells you that the smallest value out of all these possibilities in between will be taken when n is 1, uh, s is 1. So the minimum of this ps, when s is in this set, is n minus it's when n is when s is n minus 1 so basically n minus 1 times 1 which is n minus 1 so the smallest possible value is taken when s is n minus 1 s is 1 or n minus 1 so you get the same value so that means PS is always bigger than this number. Okay? But then minus PS is always less than that number. Yeah. But what's this number? This is n times n minus 1 over 2 minus n minus 1. If you write this as n minus 1, n minus 1 minus 1, you get n minus 1, n minus 2, or 2, which is n minus 1, choose 2. <coughs> now, we need somewhere which says if disconnected, you have to be this, which means we just got this number. So it's disconnected. You cannot have more than this many vertices. So what will happen if I have more than this many vertices? It cannot be disconnected. That means it will be connected. Okay. So what we showed is disconnected implies that number of edges cannot exceed this number. So if it did, that means we are connected. Okay. So if you have a network. Suppose you have one million vertices, so many, and you have some idea what the edges are, and you just plug this number in, and you find that your edges is more than this. And you conclude that any two people can communicate without doing anything else. And you have one million vertices, so checking by hand or any algorithm, computer algorithm, if they are actually connected and half, will be very, very big search. So by this theorem, you just know it. As soon as your number is bigger than this, you're connected. It's, I mean, it's a big number, but still, to have at least a theorem saying, of course, I think, uh, depending on graphs, you could improve this number. But so this, this proves the result, OK? This is what the result was, and we proved it. So if it is bigger than this, connected, because we proved when it's disconnected, it's less than this number. Okay. So we proved the theorem.
I'll give you the homework set and I'll finish pretty much the Okay, so from Grimardi, we're doing 11.1, 11.2. So this is your homework set. Uh, it could be either Friday or Tuesday. Which one you prefer? So, I mean, we finished this material, so technically you can start doing it right now. But if you have something on Friday, I can do it Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, so it's due Tuesday. But then Friday, there's always a chance that we'll have attendance quiz or something. So come on Friday as well. Now, uh, some of the questions that involves a concept called isomorphism of two graphs. Um, let me define that. If you have two graphs, uh, and when we say to graph, we just mean undirected. A function v from v1 to v2. So you want a function between vertices. It's called a graph isomorphism if first it should be a bijection on to one on to so it's a bijection it's a one to one correspondence second Two vertices are an edge on E1 if and only if their images are an edge. Take the cell phone away. Okay. So you look at this example.
So it turns out these two graphs are isomorphic. So this is your G1, this is your G2. Since there are six points outside, it's not the obvious you know, correspondence. You have to choose three from inside, three from outside, and so on. So you can see that isomorphism means the shapes may be all different, but as long as you can match the vertices from here, the vertices here, in such a way that the edges are edges in both directions, like edges here will be edges here. So you have to make sure that. For understanding, when two graphs are isomorphic, the degrees are important. For example, the degree of these vertex is 3. Degree is the number of vertices attached. So you can see that degree is 3, degree is 3. So that tells you that it's possible. If you had like some degree 4 vertices here, you could say it's not isomorphic because they, all the degrees are here, 3. Also things like if you erase an edge here, it becomes disconnected. It should happen same way here. So uh, if you erase an edge, if you become, or two edges, if it becomes, like how many edges you need to erase so that it becomes disconnected is an invariant, which is, stays same under isomorphism. So there are something called isomorphism invariants. These are the data that you can record from the graph which will stay same under isomorphisms. So if you find more graph isomorphism invariants, then you can decide if your graphs are not isomorphic, looking at those invariants and comparing them. So some of these questions, like the ones in 9, involves isomorphisms. Okay. All for today, you can go.